Hello and welcome to Davy Forum's podcast, streaming live on Wednesday, the 23rd of June. And joining me tonight is Ed Selly. You can have any brew that you want, as long as it's a Corona. Greg Hook. I live my life a quarter mile at a time. And Tom Davis. Tuna on white, no crust. So, welcome back. You might be wondering where things are and, and we've changed the title, if you've been paying attention and so on. Uh <laughs> Hay fever season is in force, full force. I have overdosed on antihistamines. Steve tried to do the same thing, but Steve can't breathe. <laughs> because, so hopefully he'll pull through for yeah. next week. Uh, but Steve didn't make it this evening. Unfortunately, he had to fall by the wayside. And he's not the only one that's ill, because Kaz didn't make it either. So we got Kaz's double. He did standing. heroically put the competitions together before he, he died, did. though. He did. He put the, all the stuff in the running order so Tom can have a nice, easy evening tonight. Yay. We're going we're gonna to do this in an hour. It's going to be a mm-hmm. nice, solid hour. Uh, we're going to do this so we can prove that it can be done. Uh, so, yes, if you are watching this live on YouTube, then please subscribe, click the like button, and also take part in the conversation. Uh, if you put a question in tonight, you're more likely to get your question answered tonight because uh, we, we might we might be uh, relying a bit bit more on you, dear listener, this evening if things uh, don't go according to plan. But we've got plenty to talk about tonight, so uh, we're going to find what everybody's been talking about and playing with and so on in a, in a little bit. We've got some competitions that you can enter and win. We've got some competition winners. Uh, hardware-wise, we are talking Hi-Fi Rose, never heard of them, and Clear Audio, never All heard will of be them. Revealed. So we're going to learn about two new brands this evening, uh, whether we like it or not, <laughs> um, because that's what's, in the running, that's what's left of the running order. Uh, so we're going to be looking at those products. Uh, of course, we'll do a Q if there are uh, questions in there as well so get your questions in we've also got ed's album of the week and um, we're going to do some film stuff towards the end as well and like i say it's going to be a solid hour right and uh, <laughs> on that bombshell let's move things on let's find out what we've been doing this week so Ed, some interesting photos on your Instagram this week. You've been out and about. I went to London. I went to London for the first time since late January 2020. Um, And I went on a train for the first time since late January 2020. Um, It was a deserted train, so it was fine. And I didn't have to use the underground or anything like that. At the other end, we stayed in the vicinity of King's Cross for the time that we were down there. But um, it was really nice. Um, in some ways, this is a reflection of me being old, isn't it? That I'm not necessarily missing the bit where I can clamour at the bar at places yet. You know, actually a bit of civilised table service here and there is um, still quite appealing. Uh, so, yes, I popped off to Spiritland, which I've talked about in the past. Um, the, a sort of audiophile posh bar, really. Uh, it's got... Um, ghosts? Of, uh, sorry? Has it got Ghosts? Uh, no, no, no. I don't know quite where the spirit land <laughs> section for that is, but um, it does have a whacking great pair of, um, of mm. five-way compression horns. Um, so it sounds magnificent. <laughs> um, uh, and I spent seventy-six pounds on drinks in two and a half hours, which was quite an achievement in its own way as well. <laughs> um, so that was all good. Then a spot of Vietnamese food. After that, it was nice to be back out in the world. Uh, and then, unfortunately, I've had to come back and king like a loon as i say it's been an incredibly busy month both in review terms which obviously is the sort of public side of the work that i do but there's also been a lot of rushed consultancy for products that will be released um in the coming weeks and months where i essentially um ghost review them and try and find what's wrong with them before other people do so yeah it's been absolutely flat out um But, you know, it's all good. It's nice to be busy. I'm not going to complain about being busy in the current climate. So, um, yeah, it's I'm not going to argue with any of that. But I'm just stalling, really, because uh, Phil's new toy has turned up. And I thought we could segue effortlessly into that because I've seen the photos and it does look extremely yellow. It's it's bright. Now that I've obviously seen it in person, um, it it doesn't look like the photos. And the photos, uh, as you'll see, um, when they appear, it's not the same hue of yellow uh, from one photo to the other. It it changes with the light. So, um, yes, I picked it up on Friday on a dull and rainy day. Yet it glowed like some radioactive yellow thing. It's a uh, it's a loud color. It's uh, and and it, 
correct name for it, calling it Sharpie. It looks like a highlighter pen. I uh, still think a banana car. Look at that. I, I still no, think no, 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 no. It's not a banana. It's Stabilo not. Boss would have been a better name. <laughs> but... It is. It's <laughs> Sharpie. Sharpie is the name for it. It's. It's not that yellow. That yellow is wrong in that photograph. I'm. I'm getting a tan just from looking at the picture. <laughs> Yeah, so um, so I had loads of great comments parked up in the street because I picked up on a Friday. It went to the detailer who worked on it over the weekend. I really have to thank Chris for that. He's absolutely fantastic. He put the work in over the weekend to get it done for me so I could pick it up Tuesday morning. Um, jumped in the car and went straight up to Scotland uh, to put the miles on, on the car um, and then took some photographs when I got back, which is the photograph you're looking at there. Um, so, yeah, it is. It's yellow, but it's, it's not yellow. It's very... Um, there's a bit of a green tinge to it when you see it in person um, compared to how cameras pick it up. And and it's three different shades of yellow in that picture. So the correct yellow is the one that's probably on the door. Um, that's kind of the correct right. view of it. Um, it's not as bright as the front looks in that photograph. But yes, it stands out. Lots of people um, in the street passing by taking photos and, and all the rest of it. So... I do quite like Martin Gillespie's suggestion. It should be called Hazmat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it, one of the things is the gearbox is obviously a manual, um, but it's the one out of the Shelby, um, and it's a notchy gearbox. And, of course, we don't use our right hand to change gear in this country. We use our left hands. And uh, my left hand's a bit weak. And uh, trying to get it into gear because it's a really notchy gearbox um it's it's really really tight at them it's a really tight box at the minute has it been really sprung correctly for right because you know get they they change the the spring release from left no. to right hand drive have they no. actually bothered I, to do I, that I sat, I sat in the passenger seat and i could i could row through it not a problem um sitting in the driver's seat it's just super tight but yeah. it will it will slacken off the more like you use it so just change about the clutch a couple of times that will sort out yeah well again the clutch has got a really high bite point Oh, lovely! So, um, so yeah, you're you're almost fully off the pedal before it bites. So it's it's been taking a little bit of getting used to. Uh, but like I say, I went up to Scotland and uh, we're going out at the weekend. So I think on Saturday we're going up to High Force Waterfall and then up to Austin and Cumbria and back, and then we're going to Scarborough for an ice cream on Sunday. So, so yeah, we've got plenty of meats and getting back to normal. I was in Newcastle City Centre today and it was nice. Um, it was nice just to have some normality you know people mm. walking around mingling talking social distancing they were t doing the rules had the masks on when they were going inside places and so on but it was just nice to get back into a busy and it was busy a busy city center um, i haven't done that for such a long time and it was it was nice to do that today so um so yeah that's what's happening with me uh we'll talk about gear when we get to the hardware section um we'll we'll go through that in a second but we need to find out what greg's been doing because greg hasn't been on the podcast for six weeks is it mm -hmm. so is it that long i think it's about six weeks yeah so wow we to. well you thought i'd have something to say what i've been doing for six weeks but um i have been watching the marvel movies in timeline order fair enough that sounds I, like a good use of your time. Yes, because when I was uh, reviewing the Clear Crescent Speaker, which we'll get to later, I uh, watched Endgame whilst reviewing it. And then, of course, I had to watch all the films again. <laughs> and I'm uh, currently on Ant-Man <laughs> and the Wasp. Had, so had, had is wow. a strong word in that sentence, I find. Um, yeah. You've powered <laughs> through them if you're back up to Ant-Man and the Wasp now. Yes, I did. Uh, yeah, I watched one every couple of nights. So, yeah. Um, and then this week I'm off work and I spent yesterday in hospital because I was doing some gardening on Monday and a branch whacked my eye. So, um, in fact, I'm lucky to even make this podcast because yesterday I couldn't see out of it. Well, so, to be honest, that, that appears <laughs> to be a recurring theme about almost everyone doing a podcast <laughs> at the moment. Fundamental blindness seems to, yeah. be, uh, <laughs> it seems to be pretty much. But you could have rocked a proper eye patch or, oh, okay, um, yeah. or as a glasses wearer, you could have gone for um, like Archangel in in Airwolf with just the single branch <laughs> off lens, which <laughs> yeah. let's face it is an iconic look. Can't be a bit of Airwolf. Um, but no, I'm glad you're all right. I, mm. I trust there's no, they, they, the fact that they've let you out and that you have both eyes open, there's nothing chronically amiss. No, it's just abrasion on the eye. Mm. Um, Ooh, but was... did, you get, did you get an eye scraping? Did they scrape your cornea? No. Oh. No, they did. They put some... Um, um, 
Oh, you missed a tree. You missed out there. You missed out there. Really did. <laughs> that really sounds like fun. That does. That one of the worst <laughs> experiences of my life was uh, was having an eye injury and then saying, "Now nah, the cornea is just a bit of a wreck, so we're just going to scrape the whole top layer off." Oh God. <laughs> yeah, that was. Um, yeah, that pleasant. sounds lovely. That sounds a bit <laughs> clockwork orange, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> there he is. That I'm. Um, that, that that is how um, you, uh, you 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 go about. Um, we go about rocking the uh, the single eye look. Uh, and it's, not I actually, make... it's not actually a patch. He's just put a black just lens. Just a black lens in one yeah. side, yeah. Mm. That's what Nick Fury should get for the next Marvel movie. As long as it's a mm. special AT shape like that. Um, <laughs> so uh, he's one of my favourite 80s characters in any film or TV series. It's just, just proper CIA badass. like him. Quality. Mm. Okay. Well, thanks for that, Greg. Uh Good to see you on the podcast again. We'll get we'll get talking about some audio stuff that you've been looking at. Uh, right, so we just need to wrap up on Tom. Oh well, I've just been messing around with my PlayStation. I finally got it out of the box you, uh, and set up. Why are you sitting in the washing machine? I'm not sitting in the washing machine. This is this is my hobby. <laughs> <hole. laughs> right, it looks, it looks like you're sitting in a washing machine. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> Or, or a, a, a rustically redecorated Millennium Falcon. I mean, there's a sort of, <laughs> yes, you know, yeah. yes. it's not a damp, muddy hole, and it's not a wet, sandy hole. It's a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. There you go. All right, I, good stuff. So you <laughs> your hobbit hole. I've got a tight box, and uh, we need to get on with stuff. So, uh, uh, who's going to do competitions? I don't know what. Craig, why don't you do the competitions? Why not? Okay, so. Hang on, let me get back to the page. <laughs> okay, so current competitions. You can win an a Ajax smart wireless alarm worth over £385. And that's a really good competition because that's an alarm system I reviewed uh, a few months back and it is top notch. Um, and then we've got over £125 worth of scale electric sets to give away too. Awesome. Um, actually, I might, I might enter that. I'm just, just, well over I, In fact, I actually have whether it's allowed <laughs> uh, yeah you're fine yeah. i'm the only one that's not allowed to win anything so ah, anybody right. else it's fair game uh, just one thing how did you test this, the smart wireless alarm did you pay the local scrotes to try and break in is that what you did <laughs> yeah, no. yeah. um yeah i could have done that would have been a, a good That'd test be, but they wouldn't have beat it because it is so it was such a good system it's it, you know i think i said on the review if you want to keep the crown jewel safe you'd you'd do better than uh getting a ajax system it's so good excellent um, oh, and good yeah price, and then also we've got a bunch of 4k competitions including in the line of fire which is a patron exclusive the 50 pound basic instinct collector set and the 80 pound indiana jones 4 movie box set as well as half a dozen blu-ray competitions too including criterion's june titles yeah. so head over to avforums.com slash competitions to enter all competitions open to eligible AV Forums members resident in the UK. Okay, and then previous competition winners. Conrad 1974 won a copy of Supernatural, the 15th and final season on Blu-ray. And Leafy 1 won a copy of Big Fish on 4K. And I, I haven't seen well, one of those 15 Supernatural seasons. It must be a bit weird if you win it because you already feel morally obligated to have some understanding (laughs) of what's going on. Although one assumes that Conrad 1974 wouldn't have entered unless they had some passing familiarity with Supernatural. Unless he's a bot. I don't know. (laughs) There's a lot of episodes to get through if you haven't seen the first 14. (laughs) (laughs) That is a lot. (laughs) I mean, look on the bright side, it could be like winning season 26 of The Simpsons. Although, as I say, you've probably seen one or two of them prior to that point. So, mm, yeah. Right, okay. And, of course, uh, we've got our podcast exclusive, uh, which is coming up towards the end of the podcast. So you have to stay around for that if you're listening live and you want to enter that competition. If you're if you're not listening live, I suppose you could jump to the end and, and do that. So, uh, yeah. Right, uh, so that's competitions out of the way. That's what we've been up to. We'll be back in a second with some hardware. If you'd like to support the AV Forums podcast on a regular basis, then why not become a patron? Head over to patreon.com forward slash AV Forums to sign up. You can also make a one-off donation through the Super Chat or via streamlabs.com forward slash AV Forums. All donations help us to improve the website and the podcasts. Thank you to all our supporters. Right, so we're going to get into some hardware. I've actually noticed some comments popping up in the chat. Keep them coming in. Keep talking. Uh, give us your uh, 
your questions or anything you think we should be talking about uh, on tonight's show that you think is relevant, like COVID has ruined many a left hand, uh, says Martin. <laughs> uh, okay, if you say so, Martin. And uh, Ken, uh, I'll have you know that they were all positive, incredibly positive comments. Maybe not to, behind my back, but to my face, <laughs> all positive comments. And uh, it's supposed to be device, divisive anyway. It's supposed to uh, create conversation and you can't please everybody. If you're going Life to is too short for, yeah, for stuff, exactly. stuff that like, triangulates the lowest common denominator. So. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I think the ice cream will melt. Right, let's move on. Keep the comments coming in. Keep hitting that like button as well. If you haven't uh, hit the like button, it is appreciated. It helps us find new members of our AV cult. Let's move on. Let's talk about some products and some companies that we are perhaps not familiar with on mm. the AV Forums podcast. So uh, let's start with uh, Ed on this one. Hi-Fi Rose, I, I've i never heard of them. I don't know the logo, nope. uh, which uh, if anybody looks at the artwork for the podcast, you'll be able to see the logo for that. Never seen it. No, Don't know anything about them. No, so, no, that's completely fair. Um, they are a new arrival in the UK, but they are not a new company. First and foremost, um, Hi-Fi Rose is, if you like, it's a sort of spin-off of a much larger company in South Korea. Now, um, I point this out in the review, but uh, it's worth bearing pointing out in the podcast too. Whenever I review a product with control software, someone generally asks quite probing questions about the stability of the app, the stability of the software, and they're justified questions when you have to live with a product. Hi-Fi Rose's parent company makes very sophisticated point of sale systems um, and tills and pieces of equipment that can't go wrong, or at least they can go wrong, but you'll never sell another one ever again. This is an organization that understands quite a lot about clever bits of software. Um, the other thing that's quite unusual about this is that it is, in some ways, like some of the uh, objects that Steve has reviewed recently and um, Phil has reviewed at times, and obviously the uh, much missed Mark Hodgkinson made an art form, it's an Android-based platform. Um, it uses actually quite an old version of Android, Android 7, um, on a custom 8.8-inch uh, TFT screen that runs full, pretty much full width. Um, and uh, it completely changes sort of how you interact with it because it's got an excellent app. We'll come to that in a moment. It's got a remote, a remote handset, um, which is Bluetooth uh, based, so it doesn't need line of sight. So you can control it in all sorts of ways. But setting it up and tweaking it and playing about with the settings is so easy to do on the front panel because it's all menu driven. It's slick, it's stable, it works exactly how you'd expect it to. Um, I have used the product extensively. It hasn't fallen over once. Um, and it's, it's really rather clever. The other thing is that that screen is a very, very good quality unit. Um, if we take the absolute gold standard of display in hi-fi products, completely separate to the television argument that Phil and Steve um, pursue. Um, I've always felt up until this point that the name Unities have the best quality screen. They just about edge out the NAD M10 and the other NAD products that use that screen in, in other applications. This is as good as the name Unity screen and it's bigger. It can show an awful lot of information. It's visible at considerable distances um, and it does good things with album art. Um, Stuart was flicking through the photos for people um, uh, watching the podcast earlier on. Um, if you are of a mind to and you're feeling um, nostalgic, you can also have it. So when you're listening to music, it just pops up a great big pair of virtual VU meters because why not? Uh, but you don't have to have that. You can show album art and so on and so forth. Anything as well. with a VU meter is cool. Well, I, I completely agree. The, the one behind me is not, the, if, again, for people watching the podcast, the one behind me is not a Hi-Fi Rose VU meter. That's a real mechanical VU meter, and that's not a product that will be appearing in, on AV forums in the not-too-distant future. But nevertheless, it gives you options, and it means that controlling the Hi-Fi Rose is a very different sort of experience to most of the rival all-in-one systems. The other thing that this product does that means that I felt it was worth um, pursuing for AV forums is that unlike all of the other 
all in one systems that I have tried for AV forums over many years. It is also something of a specialist in reproducing video. Um, Hi-Fi Rose has managed to adapt. They have a customized version of YouTube, which does music related content, which you can either view on the front panel display, um, or you can send it to a display at resolutions up to 4K. Um, and by and large, I did some tests on it with the B7 here, and it looked bloody good. And it then continues to say, it obviously strips audio before it sends it to the television. So it continues to send audio to the, the speakers that are connected to it. Um, it's not my traditional way of listening to and enjoying music, but it's actually quite good fun to play with. Um, uh, I've just been asked in the comments, uh, is it a touchscreen? It is a full, that's, that's a, um, full, full width display is, is all touchscreen, yes. So you just press the area that you want and it Finger responds. Finger magnet? Um, well, I'll be honest, I haven't removed the protective cover because it's a review unit, <laughs> but all signs point to it being pretty robust and not catastrophic in this regard less so than the hard front of the name unities but that's a pretty that, that that's not necessarily saying very much if you obviously you are connecting speakers to it uh, there is a 100 watt class d based internal amplifier that's been run with a variety of different speakers whilst it's been here it hasn't shown any signs of being under any strain um, it's got plenty of power um, and it does sound extremely good. I'll leave some sound comments we'll leave for the actual review itself, but it does sound more than reasonable. Um, the only real limitations with the Hi-Fi Rose are that compared to something like the NAD M10 or even the similarly priced Quad Artera Solus Play, um, you don't get as many inputs. You get one RCA line input, one RCA pre-out, uh, one optical in and one optical out. However, what Hi-Fi rows take with one hand, they give with the other. So you can stick a hard drive straight into the bottom of it. It's got an internal bay for two and a half, is it 2.5 inch mm -hmm. size yep. drives? Yes, it'll accept those and it'll accept pretty large ones as well. Um, uh, more of that in a moment. The reason that I have to be a slightly vague is that um, there's still a little bit of experimenting to just, just how large a drive you can fit, but two terabyte three terabyte units are not a problem at all and it simply reads the drive contents and it becomes both its own it becomes a streamer with with the, the, the actual server library on board alternatively it can read off uh, memory cards or usb sticks or usb drives so it doesn't have to be network connected if you do network connect it it has a really really good wireless aerial the wireless aerial appears to be built into the front aperture of the unit it is a big aerial and it has plenty of radiating room I have found it to be unconditionally stable, and I do use that word deliberately, on both wired and wireless connections. And in this house, that is not something I have been able to say about that many products. It all sort of speaks to the fact that the company that builds it has to build business machines, which there can be no scope for them going wrong or playing silly buggers or doing any of those things. And all of that expertise wears off. Now. This isn't necessarily something as relevant to the review, but it's possible that someone is either listening to this podcast live or will be listening to it in a week going, well, why is this random small new company featured on AV forums when product X and product Y hasn't done so? One of the main reasons that I agreed to review this product is that um, the distributor for Hi-Fi Rose in the UK is Henley Audio. Now, Henley Audio, you may not have heard of directly, but they do look after a couple of companies that you may have heard of, uh, like Project, for one. Um, so Project, enormous range of turntables, all of that hardware is all distributed, looked after and supported by Henley Audio, and a very, very good job they do too. They are careful about the dealers that they choose the number of hi-fi rose dealers they've selected is small but growing but they've selected them on the basis that they know what they're doing this is not an instance where you're buying an unknown product from a man operating out of his house and it's always a man i don't mean to be sexist but it is always a man and um that's why i felt it, that was if you like what got this product over the line and into into being reviewed because it is supported by an organization that really does know what they're doing. Um, 
which means that I have the confidence of sticking it up on the site and knowing that, you know, pending an asteroid or some other sort of fully unforeseen event, Hi-Fi Rose is going to be supported in the UK by a company that really does know what they're doing. This is a different product, subtly different to some of the all-in-one systems that we've looked at, and there's more coming. They do, uh, they're both popular on the site and it's an incredibly important product category. There's another one in front of me now um, for coming up next. This, is, this feels a bit different to some of the ones that we've already talked about, and it does things that you may or may not find useful or not. I mean, I can see plenty of people being uninterested in video, especially if it's nowhere near your television, but it's a genuinely clever and well-engineered product. It sounds good, it's flexible, it, it's beautifully made, and as I say, in the time it's been here, it hasn't, hasn't missed a beat. So I am extremely enthusiastic about it um and I, if you're scooting around for an all-in-one system below two thousand pounds i think it it would be foolish not to at least give it a demonstration because it is a genuinely genuinely impressive product okay and uh like i'd say the reviews coming up for that one so keep your eyes peeled mm. um and uh and we'll be looking for that one on the home page when it turns up uh, there's one coming from Fergie B. He's uh, donated five pounds. Thank you very much, Fergie. That is, uh, it really is appreciated. He's got a question for you, Ed. Um, Why are there no Apple Connect music? To, are, is Apple Connect that uh, Apple people? Is this different to AirPlay? Does anyone know? Because essentially, um, I, uh, with a, a brief insight into my other life, I've had lots of questions asked, both private messages on the forums, the support work that I do. People are asking, how do I get 24192 Apple content to my um, to my device other than just plugging it into to my Mac or PC? And the answer is, at the moment, that is your only option. Apple, we discussed this in a podcast not that long ago. Apple has released high-res music not because it's a big step forward in their hardware. It's because they're busy killing Spotify, um, and they'll fill in the blanks um, uh, later on after that point um so at the moment there's lots and lots of little bits of widgets of hardware which aren't which just aren't um possible to uh they're just there's no support for it at the moment but as soon as apple starts rolling out developer kits and the hardware and, and the information required it, it it should start to feature in because most significant hi-fi companies have got a um got a, a an apple developers license so as soon as apple makes better access to their high-res content available i'm sure it will start to feature on on product okay well hopefully that answers your question um faggy b and thank you very much for if not drop me a private message and we'll we'll work it out from there there you go you don't get offers like that anywhere else on i mean you will get an invite to my only fans as well but we'll see if we can <laughs> unpick some of them some of how, the how much is it a month though I am having a sale at the moment because there's uh, football on and I'm struggling <laughs> to compete against muscular men. So, um, <laughs> too dirt cheap. <laughs> okay. Um, right. Let's move on swiftly, I think. Uh, so, Licensed Taxi Man uh, has joined us. Good evening. And he says uh, a lot of TVs behind it. Uh, there's four at the moment and I've got another one turning up tomorrow. So, that'll be five, I think. Four. Yeah, plus one is five. Um, so, we have the LG C1, the LG G1 in 55 inches. I have this the high sense turning up tomorrow um which is a 55 inch oled so high sense getting back into the oled game so we'll see how that stacks up on a second didn't they the... very publicly both they very publicly said they were going to make an oled then they very, very publicly, publicly said rode away work. from it yeah and now and they're decided... publicly back yeah uh, their, their motto this year is a tv for everyone <laughs> so so that's them coming back in the scene. So I'll be interested because I have got the, I've only got the LGs till Monday. So they're going back on Monday. So I'm going to be working a few night shifts uh, because I'm away at the weekend. So I'm going to be working a few night shifts this week just to get all the TVs uh, circulated around and tested and compared to each other and videoed and all sorts. But be interested to see how the high sense stands up to the, uh, the LG C1, which is going to be its nearest competitor. Uh, also got the Sony A90J there in the background, 65 inch. Uh, um, we did a bit of discussion about that last week. That's still uh, here at the moment, it's still being tested and uh, compared to that TV. So that's what you see. The big one sitting next to me here, that's uh, a Samsung Q90R. So it's a couple of years old, uh, but it's, it was probably their best 
4K TV, and uh, I don't think it's been bettered so far. So it's more of a reference point. Um, if I need to, you know, compare something to it, that's why that one's still here. So that's what I've got behind me. Uh, I've got JBL synthesis processor sitting in a rack that hasn't been uh, tested yet. <laughs> because i've been so busy with the tvs and i've got something else turned up tomorrow as well oh yes a uh, sony projector 4k native 4k projector uh that's turning up tomorrow but i won't get started on that one until first week in july and sony have said i can have it for the whole entire month of july which is good of them because it allows me to get other things done first uh, while testing it so uh, so yeah keep your eyes out for those things that's why i've got nine really to talk about tv wise tonight just very still... quickly mike b you put a message up and retracted it i saw it are you retyping it or do you want an answer to that answer in the comments and we'll work it out from there <laughs> uh yeah um i saw another question uh paul paul monga uh he said will you be reviewing the 83 inch c ones and sony no basically it's like a really small passage and i can only get 65 <laughs> <laughs> I i'm sorry <laughs> yeah Ed, it's a childish one um yeah i've got a very very small hallway and trying to get anything bigger than 65 inches through the <laughs> I mean, sixty-five inches is quite large. I mean, it's, yeah. it's not—it's not that small a hallway. Um, you see what you've started now, yeah. right? Anyway, uh, no, we can't do the um, the eighty-three inch. Unfortunately, those kind of uh, screen sizes, we'd have to go to the manufacturer uh, to reviews because I don't even think Steve could get an eighty-three inch uh, in. I think he's tried seventy-seven, and I think that's that's his limit. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to move away from <laughs> from this because. <laughs> Ed's just getting really childish, and I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna fall for it. Right. Um, what we're we gonna talk about now? Yes, another new company, and they spell the name differently as well. So Wrong. Clear Audio. Yes. Yeah. Tell us about them. Tell us what you've been looking at, Greg. Yeah, I've reviewed that Clear um, Crescent Smart Audio Speaker. Um, now, like Ed, I'd never heard of uh, this company Clear before. Um, they're a Californian company. Um, and it's spelled C-L-E-E-R, so not to be confused with um, if you're a turntable fan. There's a brand Clear Audio in German, mm. Germany even. Very good they are um, too. Yeah, C-L-E-A-R, so uh, not to be confused with them. Um, but they, they make a good range of speakers, um, various other similar audio products. Um, and the Clear Crescent is, it's, well, it's a thin of beauty, it really is. Um, if you see pictures of it, it's... Um, crescent shaped obviously to go with the name um and it's a gold um colored hand finished stainless grill it is um and it is it's it just it's a masterpiece of, of beauty it will just sit in the anywhere you want to put it in the house um and it's it it's almost a bit like a sort of a harks back to like a 70s but not in a bad way um it's just it's just such a beautiful um beautifully designed piece um, it, it really just sits there looking gorgeous. Um, so if you've got someone you have to please with your design, if you start putting things in the house, and I'm sure they'll, they'll be happy with it. Um, it just really looks amazing. Um, and onto the, it's sort of a smart speaker. Now it's a, it's one that will also work as a sound bar. Um, cause they're trying to cover everything with this. Now it, it doesn't work too well as a sound bar because it, because of the, it's a lot higher. Um, a lot taller than like your, your standard black sound bar. Um, and also it doesn't have any HDMI ports. Um, so it's all it's got is optical in, um, which still still works pretty well. But for um, most, when I tested it with my LG TV, um, it was a good few inches into the screen. So it wasn't too good in that regard. Um, but on the, the, the audio side of things, it, it's not got its own app, which was not great. It's compatible with Google. Um, so Google Home, um, once you've got that up all running, it just connects to it fairly simply. Um, and it's compatible with Apple AirPlay, Spotify Connect, all the usual um, sound services. Um, and yeah, it connects pretty well. It, it, um, it, the audio quality was excellent. Um, so, it's got... uh, so how many drivers are there, Greg, and, and how is it arranged? Yeah, it's got eight, eight drivers there, eight watt, 40 mil. Um, and they're in a curved, what they call a curved linear array, sort of following the shape of the speaker itself, um, all facing forward. And it's got two 25 oh, watt. That. 
Sorry. I'm sorry. I've seen it in the, all the speakers in a little in a little curvy smiley face. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, and then it's got two twenty-five foot. 25, 25 foot, foot. 25 <laughs> to 25 watt woofers that are facing rearwards um, oh, right so yeah it's it, it, were you able to try that in a more confined space or do they sell you specifically don't do anything as foolish as that well no it's 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 got several modes um which are um it's got a stereo widening mode um 3d mode and a room fill mode um, now the room fill mode is basically one to put on if you're not interested in the audio because they claim it as a party mode, um, but the audio is so bad. It's the sort of thing to have if you've got 20 people in the room having a party and you just want something on the background. It's not a mode to have on. Um, and the other, the main modes are the stereo widening mode and 3D mode. Um, and it's got a quite a, a strange, it's got a, a particular distance that you need to be away from it so when i was testing it if you're sort of closer than about three meters to it or further away there's a there's a particular hot spot of about three meters where the audio is perfect and if you get too close to it it sounds a bit um too bassy um but if you're in that sort of spot either with a stereo widening mode or the 3d um, it does have that sweet spot about three meters distance so if if you've got it in a really small room i did test it in a in a small room and it doesn't sound too good so you do need a reasonable size room to get the best out of it um, and it does the audio resolution it does 24 bit 48 um, kilohertz but it doesn't do the 96 kilohertz um, which is a bit disappointing um, and also it's got as i said before it, it doesn't have a dedicated app so there's no actual way of altering the um, graphic equalizer or anything that you normally get with um, 700 pound smart speakers, um, which is a bit of a shame. Um, but it just it just looks it looks so nice. You can sort of forgive a few quirks um, and you do really get good quality audio from it. OK, um, yeah, 700 quid. So is it worth That's a lot of money? Is it worth the mm. money in your opinion? Greg? Well, I think you're paying for the design as well as the quality. I think you're, if you just wanted a 700 pound smart speaker that did what you want to pay 700 pound for, I think you would probably look elsewhere. But if you wanted something that you're, is going to look as good as this looks, as yeah, well as providing, same. yeah, as well as providing sort of good quality audio, then I've, I think you've sort of got a way up if you're just happy with a, a boring black box, mm. but you, and which you want to sound brilliant, then, then there's sort of better yeah. options for it's, 700 pounds. It's like the sort of anti Sennheiser Ambio, isn't it? Well, I was just going to say this. This reminds me of the Bowers and Wilkins uh, speaker that you did, Ed, the one that sits on its own. It's about the same price as well, wasn't it? The that the was, formation? yeah, that was a, that was about 200 pounds more. The I suppose the critical difference there is that since I reviewed that, Bowers and Wilkins has um, lo locked their engine, their software engineers in the room without any food. Uh, until they came up with more control apps, more options, and more flexibility. Mm. It would be fascinating to to side by side them. I don't doubt for a second that the clear will outperform it for um, for TV work, but it's the margin of how much it outperforms it, because I have every suspicion that the Bowers will hit back hard when it comes to music. And the Bowers are actually is a bit different to the clear, because every time I tried to take a photo of it, I couldn't possibly do it justice. It's one of those products which is so much nicer in the flesh um but nevertheless i you know the photos of the clear look spectacular i mean also don't ignore the mu name muso qb2 that's i mean it's a fun it's an awkward shape to stick under a television but it's phenomenally good mm. so um questions have come in uh if you wanted or greg have you got more to say uh no <laughs> I'm, I'm happy for questions uh, very, Mike B has asked, will there be review samples of the name Solstice? This was the turntable that was announced on June the 21st. Excellent piece of PR work there, name. Well done. Good. Um, the honest answer is it's unlikely. Uh, it's If they do stick to only making 500 of them, the honest commercial answer from the perspective of AV forums is that it doesn't make a huge right. amount of sense to review a product that you can't actually buy because my gut feeling is that almost all of those 500 are spoken for. If, and this was a comment buried in the name release, demand is at such a point that it enters series production, then it's not outside the bounds of possibility, but a 16,000 pound turntable is still a bit out there for the stuff that we've been doing. 
so we'll see how we go and um martin gear has asked a question for ed do you use a machine for cleaning your records can you recommend one please i do use a machine for cleaning my records i use the stupidly named but very very good oki noki um <laughs> well that's what it's called um but both project make the vcs for similar money which whilst very loud is very very good um and if you've got a bit more cash there is one from the magnificently prosaically named keith monks um keith monks has been making record cleaning machines for donkey's years and that's all he does he makes an affordable one and it's absolutely brilliant it's sensationally good so yes i do use them um i generally don't uh, but i'm not one of those fanatical people that cleans every single record the moment that i buy it so um it's it's it comes down to what your needs are but the okinoki that i use is more than up to the job of salvaging all but the most irredeemable of records okay there you go we we'll learn something new every day. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. fascinating stuff. But see, I'm so glad you didn't go down his 12-inch route. We would have been in fits of giggles and looked very, very childish. So I'm, I'm glad you didn't go that way, Ed. Right, no, every that now wraps, and again. You know. That wraps up hardware. We're looking good for being a, a slick hour here. Uh, right, so we're going to go to software next. If you enjoy the podcast on YouTube, then please like and subscribe. If you're listening to the audio version, then please leave us a rating on your podcast app. We invite you to email questions and feedback to podcast at avforums.com and join in with this episode's discussion thread in the podcasts forum at avforums. Okay, so uh, let's move on to software. Let's uh, do Ed's album of the week. Now, this is a Venus Artists uh, album. So keep it short. We're not going to go through every single. No, we're not. Uh, no, we're not. It's it, it's um the reason this came up <clears throat> again, and we've had some slow weeks in 2021. This was another example of that. Nothing blew my frock up overly. I don't know if Tom vehemently disagrees with that. Uh, um, that, that possibly, possibly. Well, we'll come to that in a moment. But <laughs> this was interesting for a couple of reasons. Uh, Shango Records. Uh, who are based in Greece, um, have put out a compilation. It's on Bandcamp. It's on all the major streaming services. And it's called When Tigers Used to Smoke, which is not them being weird. It's an old Indonesian proverb. Um, and that should be a bit of a clue. Essentially, they are an electronic label, but these are uh, a collection of tracks that mix um, or rather sort of combine uh, electronica with elements of 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 you know world music and i know that the moment i say world music a number of people have a sort of instant brain fart and want nothing to do with it but i really enjoyed this it's it's not it's not some it's not music for the ages but it is a bloody good listen to have on in the background in the way when the weather's nice as well it just flows um, and there are some standout tracks on there. I, I'm not going to go into all the, I, but the second track on there, um, I've dug down into some of the other things that the guy has done and they're actually all pretty bloody good. Um, I'm not suggesting, I mean, if, if you do want to buy it on Bandcamp, I understand that the 20 euro price includes a donation to efforts to uh, save Indonesian tigers, which is part of the reason it's called what it is. That's stop them um, smoking. Well, I mean, if they do cut down on smoking, it's definitely going to help them live longer. Did, did they get patches? Um, I don't know. Can you imagine trying to stick a nicorette on the side of a full-size tiger? <laughs> I probably would pay to watch that, in all, all fairness. Um, this is, as I say, it, this is, if I hate to use the word placeholder recommendation. I really enjoyed listening to this over the week. I think it's very good. Is this going to feature in my albums of the year? at the end of the year absolutely not but i've thoroughly enjoyed it in the meantime if you do fancy buying something interesting on Bandcamp, you are going to make a donation to save some tigers as well and you can feel worthy whilst you're listening to some actually very good sort of ambient electronic music with with some world flavors nice okay. cover on it as well I, i'm still listening to mammoth i've had it on uh, uh oh yeah i've been caning constant that. constant loop here fantastic it reminds me of the 80s right have you been driving with it or is that just a risk a, too, a bit of a, a no I've, I've, I've got to take it easy at the minute breaking yeah. it in so yeah that's that's losing your license uh money there tom uh, did you have another alternative oh yeah well um it's linked to um a netflix special interestingly mm. enough so earlier in the month um 
early YouTube sensation Bo Burnham, now a famous man in his own right for you know directing uh, eighth grade, and he was in Promising Young Woman. And anyway, his his first love is uh, music musical comedy. Um, he he writes comedy songs. That's what he's famous for. Um, but his latest special on Netflix called uh, Inside was just him in a room on his own for the course of lockdown for a year, basically starting out quite upbeat and I'm going to make some new stuff and ending in the same existential angst that we all experienced um, over sort of mm. like the last 12 months. Um, and it goes from being extremely funny to being quite um, quite personal and cutting and um, genuinely uh, emotional music and it's a bit outside what he's famous for which is silly little throwaway songs um, and there are a couple of those in the show um, but it goes so much deeper than what I've seen him do before um, and it, this was released as an album uh, at the end of last week or the beginning of this oh. week in the last few days anyway and uh, I've just I've had it on repeat because the funny stuff in it is hilarious, but also that's not necessarily the stuff that I'm going back to listen to again. It's the stuff that I'm finding that I related to most um, of my experience of like being in lockdown and, you know, having to be creative, but on your own, in a room by yourself. Mm. And it's it's really, really interesting. Um, I, I would recommend watching the special rather than just buying the album outright um because it gives context to it is the album on the streaming services it is yes okay. well um it's definitely on spotify and That's on amazon sign so yeah so if it's on yeah. Amazon. It will make its way to most other things. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, I really, I really recommend. So that's like a a watch and a listen recommendation. Um, but yeah, so that that would be my ultimate record of the week, I guess. Excellent. Okay, good stuff. Pro, pro, uh, in some goes more cerebral than mine. So well done, Tom. <laughs> well, we haven't had what Greg's got to say yet. Greg could uh, play a blind. Lower so the way. You've yeah. been listening to anything that you're going to recommend. <laughs> Uh, oh, I don't know about that. Uh, well, I've, I tend not to listen to a lot of music, to be honest. So um, what was the last thing I was listening to that I want to actually own up to? Um, <laughs> so there's two separate categories there, isn't there? Yeah. Um, what was it? It's probably some movie scores because I just can't get enough of them. All right. Um, if I'm ever listening to anything, it's just movie scores. Um, okay. Usually Hans Zimmer. Um, yeah. So especially the one from Dunkirk, the um, I think it's called Variation 15. It's the um, ending scene um, that goes on for about 10 minutes. It's really, really good. Um, yeah. OK, good stuff. Uh, and like I say, I'm still listening to Mammoth. Go check it out. We talked about it last week. So mm. if you want to know about that, go listen to last week's podcast. Right. Um, uh, OK, M music went on a little bit. So we've cut into your film time a bit there, Tom. So, <laughs> I think we, we we might have to sail past. Uh... Uh, no, no, no. We're going for a tight hour here. I, right. I, do you know what? I think we will, but I don't think it'll be by much because I'm actually, I'll 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 talk a little bit about um, the film first. But basically, everything that I'm going to talk about uh, on the podcast tonight is going to be something that is on Disney Plus because they have just released a, a tidal wave of stuff in June, and some of it has been great. And some of it has been sort of middling so-so. Um, and I think the film Luca, which is a Disney Pixar, uh, it was destined for the cinema, but got pulled and has now been released on Disney Plus. Not, I should say, not as a, a, a premium rental, but just in the way that they released Soul. It's part of the subscription. So if you're subscribed to, to Disney Plus, then you, you get it included. Um, and yeah, it's the latest Pixar movie, and it's hitting that kind of so-so ground for, for a lot of people, uh, including Kaz, who wrote the review of it, really um, great, incisive review. It's a movie about um, a little boy who is a sea monster, like a sea dragon, essentially, and he does sea farming. Um, but he finds that when he goes up to the surface, he actually uh, takes on human shape. Um, and the first time this happens, he finds another 
um, sea monster slash boy um, who is there to sort of like show him the ropes of like how to pretend to be human. Um, and it's a really, really lovely film um, about friendship, you know, spending one intense summer together when you're, you know, before you're a teenager and sort of that, that purity of play and of aspiration and of dream. It's really lovely. It's, it's set in an Italian coastal village and the two of them are just obsessed with getting a Vespa. And that is... And rightly so. <laughs> that, that's the whole of the story, more or less. Um, they, there are a couple of bits of adversity here and there, but really it's just about them becoming firm friends in their desire to be human and have a Vespa. And it's it's really, really lovely. It's a really touching movie. I think where people are struggling a bit with it, or maybe not struggling, that's the wrong word, but where people are, are finding it less sort of involved than previous Pixar movies is that it's fairly like inconsequential. It's a really small scale movie. Um, and when I was watching it, the thing that I was reminded of most was the, the Studio Ghibli movie, Kiki's Delivery Service, um, which is a, a, a Japanese movie from the, the 90s about a girl who is a witch, uh, but she is just learning how to be a witch. She goes and starts a delivery service in a town somewhere and just for a summer makes friends and delivers parcels. And that's the whole movie. And um, Luca shares a lot in common um, with that sort of um, low-key structure. Uh, and not just that, the, the way that it's designed is also very sort of like Studio Ghibli inspired, as well as other inspirations like Ardman. You can see that sort of um, Ardman animation style to the characters. Um, and the whole thing is just about picking little bits from, from cinema. There's a bit of, you know, reference to Fellini in there. There's a a bit of cinema paradiso in there there's and it's just a really really genuine um and i don't want to sound mawkish but it's quite a heartwarming movie most impressive of all um and this is a bit of a backhanded compliment but it is the closest that disney have got to um coding a main character as queer it is the closest that you're probably going to see in any Disney film of a same-sex relationship. Um, and, and that's uh, not just me reading, <laughs> reading what I want to see into it. But it's, it seems very clear that the, the relationship between these two boys, the way they act on their own and the way they interact, there's some really, really clear sort of um yeah queer coding and it's interesting for that reason it also sucks for that reason because come on disney why have we not had a gay main character ever that's a conversation for another time but anyway i i would recommend going to watch it i think kaz gave it a seven i think i would probably agree with that i i might bump it up to an eight because well, i just your, thought, your rates are quite hard to to secure so it was it was just so genuine uh, and that's that's what i liked about it okay. um, it didn't it didn't push too hard and it was really really enjoyable to watch and the thing is if you've got disney plus already no ain't gonna cost. kiss your petty yeah <laughs> go try yeah. it see what you think you've got nothing to lose it's yeah. only an hour and a half yeah. long and it's got sasha baron cohen doing a really weird thing in it so that's quite funny as well yeah and of course um, Dolby Atmos, Dolby vision yes uh, on yes disney as well so yeah. it is yeah, all of all of the above. So it looks Te beautiful as well. Your, your AV system as well, right? So let's move things on a mm. little bit. Uh, let's move to TV shows. Lots to talk about here because I've got stuff I want to talk about here as well. But I'll let you crack on with your Disney Plus uh, stuff, Tom. So yeah, I'll I'll talk about each of these three three things quite briefly because they're ongoing series, all of them. So firstly, the latest Marvel TV show, Loki. I am massively enjoying this i have to be honest uh, uh, as we have possibly worked out over the several years I've been doing this, i'm not necessarily the target audience for um for this of the ones so far this one convinced and by some margin grips me the most mm, absolutely i think where where one division pushed maybe a little too hard too quickly into one the super i weird. think one division was also as much about um rewarding 
people who really have put the time in. Mm. I'm, I'm not that. That's fair enough. It, this is this is Terry Gilliam does some Marvel. It it's really lovely. is. It really is. So yeah, where where one division I think pushed a bit too far left field too quick for some people, and Falcon and the Winter Soldier was just very average. I mean, it was it was I enjoyed it, but it was it, it was too early. Yeah, early. it didn't try anything. Yeah, this I think has just pitched it perfectly it's pretty weird but it's also very accessible yeah. and yes. um, I'm, I'm it's saving just them up. fun it's beautiful yeah, yeah. Save, well gonna save them up for a weekend and mm. i mean uh, the, the people who have worked on the sets and and, and some of the little yeah. detailing work in that they deserve the highest praise it, yeah it, it is a, the world of the authority is just so tangible and layered and and compelling and I'm I'm having a, a particularly good time with it because I, I think I've got a pretty good handle on what the twists are this time. Oh, <laughs> um, from a from we'll, a, we'll, a save, we'll save the spoilers for fast and Furious. Oh absolutely. Yeah. From a from a uh, an A V perspective, it does look a little bit muddy sometimes. Um what are you watching so, it on, Tom? Um I am watching it. Do you know what? Well, you've caught me off guard. I can't tell you the name of my TV. It's not my area of expertise. Come on, I'll tell you about the content, but you know, okay. I have to. Be, um, I have to be honest. It's looked uh, again. I'm not a trained observer. It's looked all right. <laughs> it's looked all right on my B7. Um, uh, I have found that Owen Wilson, Owen Wilson's uh, low level muttering. <laughs> could do with being stepped up one or two notches um now that's maybe a fundamental of the fact that i or my dialogue has to be pushed to left and right because there's no center but um he's been he's in the first two episodes he's had two sets of asides which have been lost unless you stop it go back and wind wind the level up it's not christopher yeah. nolan unintelligent <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's just um it's just one of those things and whether that's a simple aspect a, a simple element of how my b7 is down mixing i don't know i don't want i don't want to no, it seems call to be, it as being it seems to be a, a a strange trend with some uh sound designers um because it was a bbc drama as well and they did the same thing where it was really hard to to make out what people were saying uh, because it was mixed in a certain way, which didn't help dialogue. So, and these actors that mumble as well, they're, they're hard to make out what they're saying anyway. So, yeah, um, we'll have a look at that one. We'll have a look at that one uh, soon. Have a look. yeah. It's not long now until it's all all done. There's, yeah. I think it's the. Am I going to get this wrong? Is it the third one today? Yes, third um, one. So there's only a, there's only a couple of weeks of it left. Three weeks of it yeah. left. So, six, um, so there's six episodes again. Six episodes of an hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, a Disney hour. So 45 minutes and 15 minutes of credits. <laughs> it's a it's a Sunday in the cinema room with a projector and some popcorn. For sure. Yeah. And then, to be yeah. honest, I have to be honest. I've enjoyed. I don't know. Maybe I'm. This is a, a fallback to to how things work. I I enjoy this one episodically. I'm sure it'll work brilliantly as a six hour uber movie but i've mm. i found i've not had a problem waiting a week between what, what i found is i managed to do that with um one division um but then there would be a certain week where i couldn't watch it or i'd forget and then i'd have to catch up to the next week and then i just thought oh, i'll just wait till they're all there and then i can do it um in mm. my own time oh, no, there's, there's pros and cons mm -hmm. to all the different approaches so. yeah i'm 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 enjoying having something to look forward to each week like i i quite like that that anticipation it gives a good amount of time for little mini speculations in between um i'll, I'll just move on really quickly to the other two things that i was going to talk about um both mid-season at the moment one of them is i think um steve's probably mentioned it on a previous yeah. week uh the bad batch um, this continuation of the, the Star Wars Clone Wars animation um, has been a little bit underwhelming, if I'm honest. There's been a couple of blinding episodes and a couple of really lovely references if you're a Star Wars nerd, but it's taking its sweet time to get going. And they, I'm, I'm not finding myself excited to watch it each week. It's kind of I'm just watching it for routine, which is a shame because... Um, I'm also sort of re-watching um, Star Wars Rebels at the same time, and that is just awesome. E like, mm. episode to episode, it's brilliant. Um, and The Bad Batch is, is not quite um, that. How many episodes? Because that's I'm just looking at your uh, review. That's May the 4th. Uh, you did that review, so that's... 
it's been running quite quite some time. It's nearly two months. It's been yeah, running. that's right. I think I think I think Friday is the ninth episode. And I, I think there's probably I think there's fourteen episodes, or it might right. be sixteen actually. Come to think of it, anyway, it's it's low teens. I think low to mid teens. Um, so I'm really hoping they get a move on because they've spent a lot of time shoehorning in cameos from the Mandalorian or sure shoehorning in you know like the the most ridiculous um references totally unnecessary anyway that hopefully that'll pick up but we've got a few more weeks to go from that and the last thing that i want to talk about is um marvel's modok which i was really looking forward to it's a, a stop motion style 20 minute sitcom about a marvel supervillain um done by the robot chicken team and it's not very funny I <laughs> really, really wanted to like it. It's uh, Patton Oswalt is in it. Ben Schwartz is in it from Parks and Rec and Sonic the Hedgehog. Um, Melissa Fumero is in it from Brooklyn Nine-Nine. It's got loads of great people in it. Um, but it's just not very funny. Um, um, it's a shame because Modoc is a hilarious supervillain without having to write a sitcom for him. It's just, he's just stupid. And then... It feels like they're just falling back on like broken family sitcom tropes, and it's just so. Don't bother with that one. I would say give that one a miss. Wait till the bad batch is all out, and then cherry pick the episodes that are good. But Loki, go give it a a, a look. Get stuck ASAP. in balls deep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you've been watching, Greg? You want to discuss your TV wise? <clears throat> yeah. Well, it's um, not really watching a lot of tv lately but i did see a good film on netflix um a good called... film on netflix or oh, do tell well <laughs> relative i suppose Red it was... no <laughs> it was called the dead don't die um, oh the jim jarmusch comedy oh right. yeah is that the one with um bill murray and but yeah mm-hmm. it's oh, right. it's extremely slow mm. um but it is it's got some laugh out loud moments and some great um references um, and it, it also has the feel that the whole film is completely improvised because um, there's a couple of times where they break the fourth wall um, in bizarre ways. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's a really good, it's a really good film, but it's not, if you're expecting a um, 28 days later <laughs> action, you know, running zombies, all that kind of thing, you'll not get that with this one. It's just a slow, really well-made um well acted um good film i was really looking forward to it but i remember when it came out it came out to some really lukewarm reviews mm. well it, it, um, it wasn't it wasn't uh, a wide release when it came out because i tried to see it at the Odeon, mm. um and it wasn't getting a commercial release at the big cinemas anyway i think it was more art house cinemas that were um showing it or smaller independence they, that were showing they it, did so. show it to the cinema world near me but like you say it wasn't it wasn't like it didn't get a week it got like no. a day <laughs> yeah um yeah. yeah i think if people are expecting the, the traditional zombie movie you know they'd be disappointed because it, it isn't that um and it's sort of the film if you were expecting that you'd walk out after about 20 minutes because there's some scenes that just drag on for so long um but works well in the, this film um, but I think if you're expecting something else, you'd be disappointed. But it knows it's worth a watch. Okay, good stuff. Uh, I've only been watching one thing, but I am so glad that I did watch it. And I'm only I'm only five four episodes in. I've got two more to do, and that's uh, Jeremy Clarkson's um, thing farming on, documentary. On, on Amazon. Um, it is uh, uh, Jeremy Clarkson's farm. It is absolutely brilliant. Love him or hate him, I hate um, him. This the start of the show. <laughs> the start of the show for me is Caleb. Well, the start uh, of the show is the British countryside. And and the fact is that um he does his silly things as you would expect Jeremy Clarkson to do, but there's actually a serious message serious message behind everything that's that's done. And he's shown farming for what it is, which is a bloody hard job. Mm. Lots of red uh, tape to get through. Um it's not an easy way of making a living, it's incredibly hard work. Um and uh, even though he does the silly stuff, it all of it has a serious point at the end end of the episode, and uh, yeah, it's well worth your time. Even if you don't like Clarkson, go watch it because because the, the supporting cast are absolutely brilliant. Um, it's not as scripted as Top Gear got in the in the end. Um, it doesn't feel scripted in any way. It actually feels like 
they've had an idea, let's go do this, and and it and it's ad libbed, and and the results are what you see, um, and it's been really quite entertaining. So that would be my recommendation if you've got time. It's only six episodes of this season. I think it's six episodes anyway. Um, and it's it's well worth watching. And he does a different thing in each episode. So he does tractoring and sheeping and other farming stuff. He, he... Factoring and sheeping are those the <laughs> Sheep, yeah. words. So, well, well, that's, 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 that's the name the of the episode. Names. So there's tractoring, yeah. sheeping, yeah. tractoring, yeah. sheeping uh, yeah. shopping because they do yeah. farm shop. Yeah. Yeah, uh, farm yeah. shop with sixteen tons of potatoes in, and eleven insecting. eggs. I, th- I think there's one called insecting or something like that, which is, um, which was the most interesting one for me. You know, yeah, insects are disappearing, and if insects disappear, then we're mm. we're done for. Mm. Yeah. Um, so that was really interesting to see. Uh, you that know, was wilding, wasn't it? Wilding. That was it. That was it. Yeah. So yeah, um, there's, there's, it, it's good fun. It's it's HDR and all the rest of it. It's nicely done. It's nicely edited. It's funny. Um, and the the guy Caleb, the young guy that helps him out on the phone. Oh no, he he's going to he be is, whether he uh, likes it be or a not. Big star. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, he, the way he talks to Clarkson as well is just brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. You know, doesn't you know? There's no hero worship in there. He just he tells it as it is. It's great. So that's my recommendation, Ed. Um, nothing different to what I say. I've been enjoying Loki. I've been enjoying Clarkson's farm. Uh, I would just like to point out that on Friday, it's the big dump of air crash investigation episodes on Star. Oh, yay. So um, if you are a, a, a sadist like myself, you can't argue with that. I uh, think it's, I think not, it's, one... not, it's not a complete set. It's seasons 10 to 18. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, I don't know what the deal is. Obviously, newer seasons, that's presumably down to the, the ongoing agreement with Sky. Probably. I don't know what, other than the fact that some of the old ones are quite ropey looking now, I guess. I don't know what precludes seasons one to um, nine appearing. I think there's there's some legal issues about some of the episodes that went, and some of the earlier episodes. Um, I know they had to pull some of them because of legal, or that the reports changed or, or they were reassessed. Mm. And, and No, I suppose that's fair. So, but you would have thought um, that you could have picked those ones out. But I've got to say, the one I watched the other day about the 777 crash landing at Heathrow, where uh, I think it was the, you know, nobody died on it and so on. Is that an accident or is it just a mishap? Well, no, it, the fact that how hard that it was, was a joke, to find. Way. Yes, it, I, I, I find out I, that one was astonishing because it was. It comes down to it, it's one of the if you like that's one of the the gold standards of just working out what the bloody hell happened it well and truly be above and beyond especially the when the evidence disappears yeah uh, to what actually caused the crash so yeah interesting stuff so mm. uh, that's our TV roundup so I guess we need to just finish off with uh, uh, the Fast and the Furious for some strange reason because <laughs> uh, because somebody's silly enough to go to the cinema to see it I'm um, really looking forward to it. I, I just want to say uh, uh, five was the best. Um, the rest are uh, not so great. And, and the it, first one is and iconic. it jumped the shark ages ago. Um, I, they've jumped everything actually, and not just the shark. Everything <laughs> uh, submarines in the last one, if I remember right. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean it, it, it started out, and there's a great um, on a trailer on uh, Screen Junkies that did it this week. Um, of the Fast and the Furious, the first film, go check it out because it is uh, really funny, really entertaining. Um, but it did. It started out as as a surfing movie, but for it was car. Point nerds. Break with cars, yeah. Yeah, it was Point Break with cars. You know, change the surfboards for cars and so on. And it and it was a good film. And it and it was you know uh, throughout to the car culture and all the rest of it. It, it that disappeared very quickly. I think um, after three, it kind of disappeared very quickly, and it and it just became a big, loud. It's an action yes. franchise where wheels feature. That I that's that's the point at which I was able to become interested in. I remember the first <laughs> one released when I was um I don't know, I was maybe 17. Um and it was a it was a big deal among my peer group and I thought it was trash. Like I could <laughs> not even as a 17-year-old. I was like this is boring af like i'm i'm not enjoying myself I, I, watching I'm, this movie i i am a petrol head i'm with you i had no interest i didn't see any of these films until cars loaned me the um yeah it's 4k, 4K box at the, at the point where they stop taking themselves seriously as car movies and start to just do stupid rubbish they become really really watchable like pure nonsense entertainment like in a way that a mission movie is like 
nonsense entertainment. Mission Impossible is like super high stakes and actually kind of tense sometimes, whereas Fast and the Furious is just like a cartoon. It, it's mm. so. I don't, I don't, well, I mean, it's... The thing is, if you die in the Fast and the Furious, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's not the end. You, you suddenly come yeah. back again two or three yeah. films later. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I, 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 I've got a feeling that that's happening with F9 as well. Yeah, Han, Han comes back, yeah. Honestly, back. I've got to be honest. The, the, the let's be, let's be, be honest. The, the, the absolute pinnacle is number five. Yep. And I don't know if there's any other franchise in history which saved its best work until it was five <laughs> films in. Um, but nevertheless, that, as I said before we went live, that's the equivalent of setting fire to a bin of kitchen waste and getting a Michelin-starred souffle out the other end. It just <laughs> It's so unlikely what it is. But nevertheless, for me, because Tom was saying this week he's done five through eight. Mm-hmm. And that must be like starting, starting at, at the peak of the mountain, and just with with the, the the random ski jump of seven, which you enjoy. Is that the one with the runway that goes on for five hundred miles? Um, the, the, all air, can, the, all the airplane pitch. takeoff, yeah, um, yeah is <laughs> the one before, right? Uh, I don't know. I can't keep up. Oh no, 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 no! Merge into each other. Yeah, they really do. And I've watched them all this week, yeah. <laughs> and they merge into each other, um, but. Yeah, I I ended up having a conversation with a few friends about like the the best moments from Fast and the Furious and but... the car jumping between skyscrapers. There's yeah. you know all cars that fall off a cliff explode except for Vin Diesel's, which miraculously survives and no one is injured. Um, but my my personal favorite from from the entire series is at the end of Seven when. Um, Dwanfe Eroch Johnson, um, who has been lying in hospital with a broken arm and a broken leg, just sees an explosion out the window and goes, Toretto, gets up and just flexes out of the cast. <laughs> yeah. the way from his Can I just say, in terms of an underrated, as a, <laughs> as a cinematic sequence that's actually really quite clever, buried in the otherwise interminable dross of Tokyo Drift, the first car park race sequence is about seven minutes long maybe seven minutes long maybe not even as long as that and it is actually really beautifully stitched together i mean it's too loud in terms of how it's been done (laughs) but in terms of the construct of how to explain why this one's a bit different to the previous fast and the furious movies how they do it in that car park sequence is really clever but um, that's a random aside. I've, I've never had enjoyed by me. really clever and fast and furious together. Tokyo so, Drift, yeah. especially, well, I know. But. Luckily with F9, Justin Lin, Justin Lin, who um, did five and six. No, he did four and five, I think. Um, right. So he is he's back to direct nine. So fingers crossed we're going to have some outrageous nonsense. Four and it's was gonna Miami, be wasn't it? A hoot. Hmm? Four was set in Miami, wasn't it? No, yeah, three, right. no, hang on. Four, four is on the border, isn't it? With only pussies use nitromethane as the um, uh, oh, I don't know. All, they're all bound, that. you that's tell? yeah. Number four is the <laughs> first one with um, Gal Wonder Woman, Gatto. in. yeah, um, um uh, yeah, and then the one after that is Brazil, and then the one after that is. Uh, Deckard, Luke Evans, and then the I'm one not, after I'm that not. is Jason Statham. So yeah. Luke Evans, that's the that's the airplane one. So yeah, <laughs> that's the world's things. longest <laughs> runway. <laughs> oh man! So yes, yeah, looking forward to number nine review coming up on Friday. What you are guaranteed <laughs> with a Fast and Furious movie is spectacular stunts. Some of them are CG, some of them are for real. Uh, blistering sound effects. Uh, soundtracks are always uh, spot on. And uh, and some of the cinematography, as Ed has pointed out, some of the cinematography uh, can look absolutely spectacular. And you and can the rest guarantee the <laughs> you can guarantee a really blatant and really stupid advert for Corona. Yes, yes, um, yes, yes. But in the original movie, they obviously didn't have the deal because the Corona bottles are turned round, so you can't see the you can't see the label. <laughs> Did not know that. So yeah, it's in the uh, it's in the Screen Junkies Honest trailer. Go watch it. It's uh, it's really entertaining. Right, um, I think that about wraps up tonight. I think mm. we've covered everything we need to cover. The only thing we need to do is a podcast competition. Uh, so Tom, why don't you do the podcast competition? I can do. So let me just find the podcast competition. 
because I'm super on the ball today. It is. Uh, the podcast competition is you can win a copy of the 800 limited edition Blu-ray. And the question is, what year is the movie set in? Very simple. So go to avforums.com. We can't tell you who's got it right because only Kaz has that. No, I don't have the magic crystal ball that Kaz has to tell you how many people have guessed it wrong already. Although it, it only it was only published uh, this morning, so I don't think that many people would have uh, really got it wrong. So would have, mm-hmm. would have gotten it wrong. So yeah, right. So uh, that's that's wrapped up for this week. Uh, my thanks to Ed Selly. Dude, I almost had you. Uh, Greg Hook. You never had me. And? Tom Let's Davis. go for a little ride. Uh, right, so if you enjoyed the podcast, then please do give it a like. It's really important. Um, it does get us found in the algorithm, um, and we can bring more people into our EV cult, so please do that. You can also subscribe to the channel if you want to see us every week. Then do that. Subscribe to the channel. And if you want to see every video that we publish, uh, then hit the notification bell. And it will tell you every time we publish a new video. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. You can bookmark avforums.com for latest reviews, news, and videos. And of course, if you listen to us on a podcast provider, if they allow you the opportunity to rate the podcast, then please do give us a five stars. Um, that's if it's out of five. If it's out of 10, then give us 10 stars. Mm. Uh, but if they allow a rating, then please do that. Uh, I'm Phil Hinton. Thank you very much for joining us. And we'll see you again next week.